All right, thank you. Um, our team is focused on finding meteorites in the field with an autonomous drone. And this is us in the field with an autonomous drone searching for a meteorite. <laughs> um, this is our team, Amar, uh, Chris, Srav, uh, I'm Robert, and our mentor is Peter Yeniskins, a uh, meteor astronomer from the SETI Institute. Um, we're working with the Frontier Development Lab with the goal of applying machine learning to problems related to planetary defense. And previously, you've heard of how to defend against asteroids um, and what do these near-Earth objects or asteroids that could collide with Earth look like. And we're interested in the question of what are the NEOs made of? Um, and so there's many different known asteroid families. And these asteroid families pop are what feed the uh, asteroids that would be near Earth objects and would be threatening Earth. And so it's critical to understand what they're made of because that affects um, what type of defense mechanisms, like how an asteroid would respond to a kinetic impact is dependent on its material properties, properties and also it affects um, the threat assessment of these objects. Based on its material property, it would affect how it would detonate in the atmosphere. Um, and so to figure out what they're made of, you need to connect an actual physical sample, like a meteorite, and you need to connect it to the asteroid family that it came from. As I said, this composition is critical to planetary defense, and so that's why we're so interested in determining what these asteroid families are made of. Um, so the way that you link an actual physical meteorite sample to um, its asteroid family is by getting a meteorite sample and a trajectory, um, and then using that, using the trajectory, it will provide an orbital distance and an inclination. So as you can see on this plot, you have the distance, uh, orbital distance that different ast asteroids are on, and their orbital inclination. So if you have an orbital distance, it tells you about the resonance that the, that the meteor that caused the meteorite came from. And if you also, from this trajectory, you'll be able to get an inclination. And based on that, you can see you might be able to point to some group that would have eventually fed it into, this, uh, into a certain Kirkwood gap, which would then give it the resonance to eventually expand its orbit so that it would be Earth crossing. Um, but this is a statistical problem. So uh, you can't just have one sample and one trajectory. Um, hundreds of samples and trajectories are needed to statistically say uh, what type of objects come from which asteroid family. So the current approach um, is to develop a network of cameras. So that's what Peter has set up. Um, and then take images of actual trajectories. And then you can, based on the trajectory, if you image the uh, actual entry of a meteor into the atmosphere, you'll, get, you'll have an estimate of what the strewn field would look like. And then you can go in there and actually find the physical sample. And once you have an idea of where to look for it, uh, the current approach to finding them is to just go in the field, boots on the ground, um, searching for the meteorite. Uh, but it can take 100 man hours to find just one meteorite. And so to increase meteorite finds and link them to their trajectories, we need to, wrap, we need to drastically increase the efficiency at which we find these meteorites, because it's very difficult for just to do it, um, just looking around, walking around the strewn field. Um, and out of 800 trajectories we have, we've only recovered 27 meteorites. So that kind of illustrates how difficult it is to just find these meteorites yourself. Um, and so we really need to increase that, because there's 40 different meteorite types. There's over 100 asteroid families. Each of these asteroid families, there's a range of different properties. Um, and so in order to actually draw a line from a trajectory to a certain type of material, in order to say where that actually came from um, and what these asteroid families are uh, composed of, we really need to increase the number of recovered meteorites that we find. So what we're interested in is, can machine learning improve our ability to locate these freshly fallen meteorites in the field? And to do this, we have the objective of using an autonomous drone combined with machine learning to automate the process of finding fresh meteorites. And to elaborate on that, I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you. Right on. Uh, yeah. So we actually did this. We took a drone out into the field. 
Uh, we went to this place called Creston, where recently there was a fresh meteorite fall uh, spotted by one of Peter's cameras. And uh, we went out to this uh, red dot out here, sort of close to some of these uh, previous finds that we had towards the end of last year. Um, but one of the main things that uh, really struck me when we got out into this field, even though I've been working with Peter for the last five weeks and he's been telling me that this is a difficult problem, this is one of the hardest things that you know, confront meteor meteorite scientists today, I, I didn't believe him until I actually went out there and I saw this field, endless grass, grass everywhere, just dry grass, sun burning my face. And Peter was there, he said, just, just out there somewhere, Chris, just in the, in the field there, just find me something this big. And uh, I said, Peter, that's impossible. How, how are we supposed to do this? And so um, now that I have that context in mind, I can really begin to appreciate the, the, uh, the things that we've done and uh, how, how awesome we are. <laughs> so on the topic of how awesome we are, the FDL program was about bringing together the smartest minds in this field. We are the smartest people in the world. And they gave us a drone and, uh, and we tried to fly it. And uh, welcome, welcome to the future. Just beautiful uh, takeoff there, excellent control. And, uh, no, straight into the tree. And again, uh, it seemed like another hopeless task. But fortunately for us, there exist commercial solutions to these sorts of problems, and we're able to automate the flight of a drone relatively easy. You can see here the drone zooming along, seamlessly surveying the land, whilst the experienced meteorite hunter slowly plods along, stopping for false positives as he goes, <laughs> checking out the lay of the land, and uh, just generally being slow. So uh, we're fairly confident that we've solved the problem of surveying the land. So now the problem is, well, can we start to detect things amongst uh, these fields? So um, uh, this, this, uh, this experience uh, taught us the certain things that we would like from our drone and the things that we need. So uh, obviously autonomous flight was one of the key factors. Um, but we also found that the way we've implemented the model, that precise attitude control is uh, very important as well. Um, we've sort of specified a resolution per centimeter that we would like from our camera. Um, again, the way we've trained our model, uh, we need this sort of a resolution. Um, uh, we also would like steady imaging to remove motion blur from the photos. And uh, of course, longevity of battery life is key. Um, if we can sort of piece these things together um, along with uh, our, deep, uh, our models that we've developed, uh, it's easy to see this approach being at least at a modest gets, uh, estimate five times faster than the uh, experienced meteorite hunter today. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the problem of autonomy is solved. And the next thing we wanted to move on to was detection. So uh, we're a team uh, brought together. We've got data scientists amongst us. So the first thing we want to do, we're all excited. We're data scientists. So we say, Peter, give me the data. And Peter says, uh, yeah, I've got, a couple, I've got a couple photos on my laptop. And uh, as you've heard from the other groups before us, uh, you need much more data than a couple photos. So, uh, but as I mentioned a few times, we're very clever. So uh, we decided to uh, take, try to find some solutions that didn't require any data. So we, uh, we, we tried to do some traditional machine learning approaches, computer vision approaches. Um, and they turned out some uh, promising results early. Um, you can see here we've got a, got a couple of blobs uh, highlighted in this model on the side here. And they correspond to the three meteorites in the grass there that are quite difficult to see. So having done this, we were quite proud of ourselves and ready to go home early. But we thought, we're very clever scientists. So we'll just uh, be thorough and test another image just to make sure that it works. Um, and as soon as we did that, uh, we, we got upset. So in this instance, uh, same, same rocks, but different kind of terrain. And you can see it's completely missed the meteorites that we've placed in the field here, but got extremely excited by the pretty daisies in the field. <laughs> so these sort of experiments uh, very quickly told us that um, the com traditional computer vision uh, approaches that we were taking were not robust against different terrains, and that we, uh, we may have to try models that would require, or we might have to try models that would require training. 
So we realized that indeed we did have a data problem, and that problem was that we had no data. So uh, to remedy that problem, we went out in the field and we took uh, a range of different images using uh, rocks from Peter's collection across a, a varied range of, uh, range of different terrains. And then we also uh, scoured the web for different types of meteorites that we could also train our images with. So we've got a broad selection of terrain. We also have a broad selection of meteorites. And so with these images and data set, uh, we decided that we would like to train a model. So Omar is going to speak to you about that model and uh, how fantastic it was. OK. I first want to apologize for Christopher's behavior. He heard there was an open bar and has been sitting there for the last two hours. Um, so please forgive his stumbling. He's Australian. Um, so I'm going to go straight into uh, our end solution, or what is our current end solution. Let's play a little game. There are meteorites in this picture, and uh, there are up to four. Who thinks there, are, uh, there is only one? Raise your hands. Two, three, four, OK. There are actually only two meteorites. But this illustrates how tough the problem is on such a blown up screen. We can't even see them. Um, and this is the result of our algorithm. It thinks there are four. And if we zoom in, uh, we can see roughly why it got a little bit confused in two of the boxes. The bottom one is actually correct. So. Uh, when I first got here, I didn't think this would be possible. I've done machine learning for a few years now. I really didn't think this would be possible because the way we've set up this algorithm is to scan small patches of the size of these white boxes all across this big image. And really speaking, it has only got two of them wrong because it has said that in all of the other places there are no meteorites, which is correct. So that is a, an amazing accuracy. So we are pretty excited about that. However, this is another output image of our algorithm. So this would be much more annoying to see as someone on the computer who's looking for meteorites. But we, it's still worth noting that it does find the two meteorites, and it gets 124 incorrect patches out of 17,000, which is still tiny. So we've gone a long way, but there's still a little bit further to go. So now I'm going to talk about how we got up to this point. And the solution involved deep learning. Deep learning is a very popular machine learning based tool uh, which combines simple operations, um, both linear and nonlinear, to transform your data to get an output. The composition of these simple operations is what gives you these layers of operations, and it's why, why it's called deep. Uh, one of the reasons people were really interested in this kind of an idea. Uh, several decades ago is because it loosely represents the way our brain processes data. So our brains have neurons, data goes through them and is transformed to get some kind of output. We all have them. Some, have, some of us have better ones than others. In our team, we found Christopher and I, I had slightly weaker ones than Robert and Srivanti, which you'll probably conclude from this talk anyway. Um, so the particular type of uh, neural network we used is called a convolutional neural network. This has been state of the art on lots of different types of image processing tasks. And if you go to some of the current um, top class machine learning uh, computer vision conferences, we basically have variants on this. The way it works is by scanning. Uh, in this particular task, um, the goal is to classify input images. And the way the algorithm works is by scanning through patches of the images, applying simple operations, uh, linear and nonlinear, again and again, until you get an output probability of what the image is made of. In this case, it's a boat, um, but other instances have dogs, cats, etc. So one of the reasons this kind of an approach has been so successful is because um, in, in the previous task that um, Christopher spoke a little bit about, we had to handcraft the features that we care about to get those plots that he showed you. But what this algorithm is doing is learning the relevant feature representations in these intermediate layers specifically for the task of classification. So it's jointly doing feature extraction and prediction for you for this specific task. So here is an example of, the, uh, of an image we have taken um, for our training data. 
And as a famous scientist once said, uh, good machine learning requires uh, proper training data. Does anyone know who said that? It was Ed Liu just an hour ago. <laughs> That's probably the most recent quote anyone's ever used in a talk. Um, <laughs> anyway, so because what we're looking for is very small, which you can see uh, just at the bottom of the screen, um, what we actually decided to do is, once we acquired these images, is to grid it up in such a way and consider each grid as an input point for our training data. So the big problem with this approach is that we have an unbalanced data set in the sense that most of these patches are empty. Very few have meteorites in them. So if we feed this to an algorithm, it can get 99.99% accuracy by saying everything is negative, which we really don't want to do. So we had to be a little bit clever about getting more data. So the first thing we did was to find uh, images of the internet which were relevant. Relevant means they are quite freshly found meteorites in varying terrains around the globe. Um, but even that wasn't quite sufficient. So what we did was we found uh, pictures of meteorites on places like eBay, uh, which don't have any background. And we photoshopped them into some relevant terrains as well. So having done all this, uh, we have uh, a short summary of the data we have. So we had uh, 320 patches from what we had taken ourselves with our phones. We had 280 from the internet and 35 from Photoshop. That's still a really tiny data set. As we've seen previously, we need thousands of data sets, if not uh, data points, if not tens of thousands, to do anything useful with uh, deep learning in particular. So in order to artificially increase the size of our data set, we use some data augmentation techniques. Take that patch, for example. One thing we could do is rotate it. Rotating the image doesn't change the fact that it's a meteorite. But to a computer, it gives it a lot more information because it reads everything on a pixel level. Um, another thing we can do is reflect the image. Um, we can also change the resolution, the brightness, and the saturation levels. So applying random combinations of these um, transformations, we, can, uh, we used 32 augmentations for each image to create a much bigger set data set of roughly 21,000 images, which becomes much more respectable. Um, so this is what we did for the uh, meteorite images. And we had lots and lots of empty images, as you saw previously already. And we applied much fewer augmentation to those to get a roughly balanced data set. So the next thing we thought of is to leverage big data. So there is a, a very popular big data set of natural images called ImageNet, which lots of people have experimented on in the form of competitions. Um, and what we did was we, we took two convolutional neural network architectures, which have, have at different points in time um, been uh, state of the art on this data set. So these are architectures that many uh, much better researchers than us have developed and trained already on that data set to get very high accuracy. So what we did was to take um, these large uh, previously trained networks as a starting point for our specific task of classifying whether or not we have meteorites. And this was useful because these, these um, trained architectures have already seen things like rocks, like grass, like hay. They know what these things look like. So tweaking them a little bit to teach them what meteorites look like is, is not as difficult a task as starting from scratch. So here is my convoluted slide of convolutional neural networks, where um, I'm showing that we trained six different types of convolutional neural networks separately for the task of predicting whether or not a patch has a meteorite in it or not. Um, and what we then did is to com combine the outputs of these models and average them to form one new big model. And averaging the outputs of individual models helps to get rid of some individual biases of a particular models. However, one drawback is, at test time, you need to pass your test image through each of these models before you can classify it, which makes the process slow. So what we're currently working on is a way to uh, distill the information of multiple big models into one small model. Uh, so how did we train all this? Um, NVIDIA kindly gave us this dev box, which is this huge box that sits next to my um, ne next to my machine and has been very useful for 
thawing my frozen food because it gets so hot. It gets to 86 degrees C. I don't know what, I don't work in Fahrenheit, so I'm British. Um, so that thing has these four Titan X graphics processing units in it. That's where all of the training took place. Um, and we used software created by, by NVIDIA called Digits, which made the process of uh, training uh, convolutional neural networks really easy. So just to give some intuition, uh, each of those six models took roughly a couple of hours to train, whereas uh, maybe 20, 20 years ago on, on CPUs, it would have taken a week or more. So now that I've done a lot of free advertising for NVIDIA, I just, and I saw Jensen has just come in, I thought that uh, I wanted to put out there, because I'm such a kind person, if you have any hardware that you'd like to test out, that's my address, please post it to me. I'll spend all weekend trying it out and giving you feedback. And I might even return them. Um, so that was all well and good. But this is our end goal, the drone. And this is a much smaller GPU that we want to have on the drone. So what we really need to do is find a way to compress these models and make them work in real time when the drone is flying, hopefully autonomously. And now I'm going to pass on to Shravanti, who will talk more about our trip to Creston. As Amar said, our objective was to have an onboard processing on the drone so that we can find the meteorites when we are in the field and get some meteorites. Oh, sorry. OK. OK, I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, as Amar said, our initial objective was to f have an onboard processing on the drone so that we go to the field and find some meteorites and come back home wealthily. But our solution is to have an Adelie Meteorite Hunter app, which, is, uh, which will collect the images from the drone and process it using the laptop, which has a web app. And it uses the NVIDIA quad-core GPUs. The story behind the name of Adelie is Adelie is a species of a penguin which is in Antarctica and it has an interesting way of co uh, collecting the rocks and we want to collect the uh, space rocks so that's why the app is called Adelie and it has um, acronym of Airborne Deep Learning Image Explorer which we are using. So the way we use the web app would be it provides a dashboard uh, where a person can run the images which are collected from the field and then process it, upload the images, then sell. Uh, and it really takes lots of time. As of now, it takes around one minute to process just the five images. Uh, think about going to the field and finding those uh, um, images from the drone, it would be probably some thousands of images and would, would take lots of time. So we thought of having this app so that we can do an onboard, not uh, onboard, but an offboard processing. Then as uh, Chris said, we are really lacking the data set. We thought of having something, uh, a way to have an upload to, sorry, uh, archiving the images, which would be used for the future learning. So any person who has this app can upload the images of the meteorite, and a person can go through them and mark, sorry, mark them as interesting if it is a meteorite. And this would be used for our future learning for the algorithm. And this was the first experiences. Uh, last week, we went to the Creston on the field. Uh, it's, in, it's an interesting place because in October 2014, of 20, uh, October 24, 2015, there was an, a meteorite fall. Around 800 grams was recorded from that place. So we thought, why not we go to that place and uh, place our algorithm and see if we could find some meteorites. And so the lessons learned, with, uh, it really worked in the no internet environment. And the speed increase was good. The validation was, for example, if we take out of 100 images, our algorithm can find probably uh, 10 patches, which would be like reduced set of the 100 images. A, person, a human intervention is needed so that he has to go and see if it's an interesting or not, whether there's a meteorite or not. Then the conclusions would be machine learning can identify meteorites in the field. 
uh, the software is still under development. We are still working on how to uh, reduce the false positives. Then the drone hardware has reached the maturity. I would say it has almost, because as of now, the drone is using the barometer, and the barometer uh, cannot uh, weigh the height. Uh, if we see a field which has a slope, the barometer would not be an accurate way of measuring the height. We thought of having a LiDAR on it, so that um, image processing can be captured very well. And the drone can potentially be more efficient than a professional hunter. As we have seen, Chris being on the field was getting distracted by the false positives. If we have a drone, it can uh, survey the uh, place very well. And uh, as it has a top-down uh, view, it can see through the grass and find the meteorite well than a professional hunter. Then, OK. There's a meteorite over there. We have seen that the meteorites can be detected through our algorithm. Our next steps would be to improve the image processing, like uh, reducing the false positives, then a faster interference time, having a weak classifier before doing the batch process stuff, so that we reduce the number of the number of the images which we would be running our algorithm on. And an improved hardware, having an autonomous height control, like LiDAR, ha having a LiDAR on it, and then having an additional sensors. Uh, guys from the Singularity University came along with us and took the, I mean, took the images of the meteorites under the infrared. Uh, this is the image of a meteorite under in the infrared. So we thought it would be interesting to map the images under thermal and the natural images and see if uh, a meteorite is got excited by the in it, and having a better camera resolution would be good, and the longer battery life. The key is the longer battery life. We have seen that it takes one battery life uh, to just survey 2,000 square meters in 20 minutes, and we could survey only like an one hour with three batteries. So the batteries is a key for here. Then this is all possible. We have seen that this is possible because uh, we have seen that a machine learning algorithm can find a better ways of learning a meteorite between or a meteor wrong. It can differentiate whether it's a meteorite or a meteor wrong. And so this is the Adelie team. And thank you. Thank you.